one big wine back on a beautiful afternoon here in Sweden. Weather is not warming up. It's just a little brighter today, but it promises to be clearing up and getting better and we're headed towards spring and all that is good. What better reason than to open a couple of grape wines. Yesterday we had the release of the Toll Puddle Chardonnays 2022. And you know, it kind of like crazy last year, I think at that point or early around this time of year, I thought it could be the wine of the year. I opened it for the tasting group that I participated in every once in a while. And they were not as enamored with it as I am, but I continue to be enamored with this wine. Although the second bottle after six months wasn't as overwhelmingly wonderful uh, as the first bottle. I think it starts to go dormant a little bit. There's a clear reduction to this wine. Maybe it becomes more pronounced and, and not in the most positive ways. It's still easily 96, 97 point wine. The 21, that is. The 20, same thing. But okay, we can quibble. Look at this. What are we on the glass? Super, super pale, light. There's a, just a sweet citrus nose to this. The reductive aspects are not as pronounced today as they were yesterday. Yeah. Wow. What a mouthful. Mm. Yeah, very pineapple and honeysuckle light, but piercing this racy acidity and this very pronounced saturating infusion of floral elements, flowers, and that citrus and a little bit of uh, chalkiness to it. Even there's some almond long very very long delicious wine super super appealing i'm not too sure it's as impactful as as last year's version but i still really like it a lot apparently it was a cool vintage it was the coolest on record for them for that site cool valley i think is the area maybe that had something to do with it but i mean gosh cool climate chardonnay so, so, so beautifully made. And once again, just a, a home run. What a great way. You just want to keep drinking this. That's why there's only so much of this left. Because it was just too easy. Even if I wanted to say that I couldn't, it was just too good. This is a fabulous, fabulous wine. Topo 2022. I can't believe how reasonably priced these are and i also can't believe that there isn't huge lineups at the store this year to, to buy it there wasn't i just walked in and picked them off the shelf and i left some there uh, a remarkable purchase you're not going to get a wine of that this quality at, at this price anywhere I, I just don't think you will on to my next one which is also a very exciting bottle but an auction what do we got in the glass well we can see that um it's, it's very uh, clear, see-through, however you want to describe it, transparent. It has a dark mori type nose, I think, or, or even recent Saint nose. And even some Chambord, perhaps, but surprising. It's more Nuit Saint-Georges, I think, especially in the mouth. Um, there's a little bit of tannin and what a, what a beautiful wine this is, though, I must say. It's so pure, and it's so the spirit of Pinot in every sense. It's the way the wood is, I think. But, you know, the, I, I keep trying to pinpoint what it is exactly in Burgundy that, that appeals to me, gets to me every single time. And with a wine like this, you kind of realize that the wood, the quality of that wood and how it's used or how it's leveraged in making these is, is just so well judged. It's just, it's an art form. Yeah, it's drying. There's some tannin, some extract, but there's also this <laughs> lovely, almost plummy nose with a bit of a lifted wild strawberry thing kind of wafting in. Hmm, the maltiness to this. Some kind of mulchy earth kind of quality, but in a very fresh sense, like a freshly rained on sense. There's no heaviness to this. It's, it's remarkably light, very agile, 
you know, nimble on his feet, dances across the tongue, leaves a little bit of carpet of tenon, heads out the other side, but still lasts. I mean, I just had Topo, which had a 30 second finish, and this is matching the finish of that. You shouldn't really expect that from a wine like this, but except other than because it's the producer. Cécile Tremblay's Bourgogne, La Croix Blanche. From 2016, bottle number 1486. Cécile Tremblay, you know, her wines are just, I mean, she's an icon now, a Burgundy icon, and the wines are impossible to find, and that's why these even simple bottles of Burgundy are ridiculously priced, you know, hundreds. So put it that way. But even so, you should, you know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, even if you can't buy the, the greatest painting that, that a painter's ever done, you, you might pick up a sketch if you can afford it. And that's kind of what the effect of this. It's like, it's being in the presence of greatness without actually the true greatness, but understanding the spirit of it and understanding where you're headed and understanding what you can expect should you ever have the means to move up and try something a little bit better. 2016 is one of my favorite red wine vintages in Burgundy. Usually 16 kind of gets People prefer 17 over 16, which I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. 16 was a very pure, clean, classic vintage, even more so than 15. 15 just has more oomph to it, has more solid body material to it. It's gonna last longer, but 16 is light and, and a bit 10 -ish in terms of its definition, but also like 10, 2010, but also maybe maybe some 13 or something kind of blurring your lines a little bit. So not altogether perfect in that sense. But you know, the, the vintages have a little bit more of a mineral kind of feel, a lighter ethereal type of personality about them. And this has this in spades. I haven't had the 16. I've had the 17, the 20. I think maybe I've even done them on film. And you can check those out. Fantastic wine, Cecile Tremblay. Highly recommended uh, if you want to treat yourself. All right, what do we got in the glass for the last wine? Much darker now, we can see. It's still quite purple around the edges, and that's going to be surprising when I get to talking about the vintage. This is, this is a completely different thing, obviously, just from the color. Somebody asked me recently in a previous video about the glass, the stemware I'm using. If I had very fine glass where that equaled the, the refinement and the feel and the touch and the, the experience of these Aldo burgundy glasses, then I would use them, maybe. But not having a glass doesn't ever get in the way of me opening a great bottle of wine. It just doesn't. I'll pour whatever glass I have in front of me. I've drank and grows these out of paper cups and I'd do it again. All right, what do we got in this glass, though? Oh, yeah, very black currant, blackberry, black currant. That's what it is. The very the sweetness of the fruit, and then there's a very tobacco-y, tobacco smoke feel to it. Surprisingly, oh wow, that tobacco touch really translates to the palate. Really comes forth on the palate. Strangely, it's not as sweet as the fruit would, and the nose would belie. Still very tannic, still very young in feel. Maybe less developed than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a much more developed bottle of wine. At the same time, it's very rich. Very shoulders standing up straight and correct posture. Good structure, good length. Maybe a little simple and there's less shimmery sort of qualities than the previous wine. There's less, less to look forward to after you've got it in your mouth a little bit, after you've tried it. Impactful wine and yet at the same time, maybe not exceeding your expectation. I love that pipe tobacco thing though. And I think it's quite particular to this wine, this combination of black currant and pipe tobacco. Leoville Lascas. Leoville Lascas. Um, well, I think most is amateur de vin, as the French would say, would have some experience with Leoville Les Cas because as a super second from the Bordeaux sort of hierarchy, a lot of people believe that it should be number one up there with uh, Latour and 
I'm not one of those people. I think it's a deuxième grand cru. I totally get that. That I can buy into, but I never feel like it, it exceeds that. At the same time, you know, the 2005 version of this, I remember I popped it young, I bought it in a hot bottle, and I popped it on a train, again in a paper cup, and it filled the car. You know, the nose was just incredible. It was such the sweet fruit, and it was so approachable and luxurious and seductive. Um, when the 06 came out, I did the same thing, not with a half bottle. I opened it young, and I loved it. I thought the 06 was a great wine, so I'm a little bit surprised right now that it's a bit dull. It's a bit expected. It is an expected type of Leo Villanescas. I might even have come close to guessing this <laughs> in a blind tasting. And who am I kidding? I wouldn't have. I, I'm not too sure how to recommend this. I think if the price is right, do it. If I had some more, I would just sit on them. I wouldn't pop them. That's my feeling for it. This isn't to say I don't enjoy the wine, you know. I do. I like it a lot. I'm going to gladly drink the rest of this, or my better half will. That's it for this time. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, there's beautiful days like the one behind me ahead. And until then, stay thirsty.